Let's, uh, let's go ahead and uh, get started again. I'm Tanuj Dior, the Chief Content Officer uh, here at SIPA. Excited this morning to be joined by Representative Paul Tonko from New York's 20th. Uh, Paul uh, has been serving New York's 20th uh, as their congressman since this election in 2008. Uh, his district includes the state capital of Albany, as well as, notably in this particular circle, uh, Schenectady. So there may be some, uh, some interesting tie there. Uh, he's a Democrat member of the Energy uh, Committee and the Environment Subcommittee, and the ranking member of the House Subcommittee on the Environment, and one of the very few engineers that are serving in Congress, and that may uh, be helpful in guiding how some of the questions uh, come out there. Uh, before joining Congress, he served as a representative in the New York Assembly for over 20 years um, and very notably served as the CEO of New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, as we affectionately call NYSERDA. Right. right? Yeah. So, well, thank you. Thank you for joining us my, today. My pleasure, Tanuj, and it's good to join with you and all of the, uh, the SEPA um, representatives here today. It's uh, a great to be at a grid evolution summit because it is totally evolution uh, at this moment. It is just good to see great things happening out there and to uh, serve on a committee like Energy and Commerce that can help underpin the foundation of support to uh, grow the, uh, uh, the invention and innovation in this industry that will enable us to uh, respond to modern day um, societal needs. I think that uh, Advancing some of these issues provides for consumers to be in control of their destiny, allows for great jobs to be produced, jobs that pay very well, and uh, also to be able to uh, advance an environmental agenda. So all these are doable. You know, many times over in the committee, I'll hear thoughts exchanged that if we support sound in, uh, environmental stewardship, we are against jobs. And I think the beauty in this arena is that we can advance sound environmental policy, you know, through our various facilities and um, through our thinking and enable us to uh, address issues like carbon and uh, to be able to go forward and create great jobs. And a sound grid system is critical yeah, right. to a strong economy that continues to grow. We're in the midst of an innovation economy uh, on a global scale, and it's important for us to not stand still. At times, I think we're slipping backward with some of the thinking, but standing still is dangerous enough. We need to go forward aggressively, and we need to make certain that we invest in research which is absolutely critical. So, uh, you know, I served uh, for 25 years in the State Assembly. You said over 20. It was about 25 years, and my last um, 15 of which were as energy chair. And so the experience there in the microcosm of New York, uh, which has great diversity, remote rural areas to serve, right. metro areas like New right. York City, um, it was a good microcosm, as I indicated, for uh, the country. And my goal when I got to Congress was to serve on energy and commerce eventually. And within a couple of terms, we got that assignment. And I'm also serving on science, space, and technology. So uh, we also learn, uh, get to deal with some of the innovative concepts there and to advance research funding, too. Yeah, excellent. Well, I, I heard the first three there. You talked about, talked about jobs and, and the economy. You, you talked about uh, a clean grid. Um, you talked about about uh, uh, you didn't get to resiliency right away, but you got there and you, and you talked about reliability. One thing that was really interesting is I think some of the, the myth we're hearing about the origins of REV was that uh, the reform of the energy vision wasn't really possible in New York hmm. until you had that momentum of a resiliency issue and you could tie that into the environmental and all the technology right. benefits. And I'm kind of curious your thoughts about that dynamic. Is that right? Is that is that well, part of what the story was? You know, I, th I think that with REV, we're, we're in this uh, updated uh, state-of-the-art world of uh, what is possible and how do we adjust our thinking within the uh, regulatory framework and in the policy framework. And I think with REV, you know, we're looking beyond that traditional utility model. We're looking at the opportunities for distributed generation. We're looking at microgrids. We're looking at the, the, uh, the soundness of uh, an environmental agenda, uh, renewables that come into fray, the energy efficiency quotients, you know, the resiliency of the system. The, the national studies have been performed that indicate that uh, uh, by the year 2050, perhaps as much as 80% of the grid could be renewable connected. Okay. So it's not going to uh, 
I don't think it's going to threaten the system. It's going to reinforce the system. It's going to renovate the system in a way that, again, provides for uh, all sorts of policy to be addressed, not just energy and environment and economic development policy, yeah. but national security, growing our energy self-sufficiency, making certain that uh, we see this sort of investment as one that speaks also to national security, which I think is so very important. I think if, we, if we're... Uh, open about uh, discussions, we will acknowledge that a lot of the advancement of our involvement in the Mideast was over oil and a fossil-based economy and fossil-based fuels. And I think it's time for us to really think outside the barrel yeah. and think uh, in positive green formats that uh, can evolve in uh, uh, a soundness of agenda that incorporates also energy efficiency as our fuel of choice. Yeah, so that's that's a fantastic, I think, framing of, of these issues that we're, we're dealing with uh, at the local level, state level, and of course at the federal level. Um, taking the specifics, a lot of folks here are, are from D.C., most are not, though, and, uh, and even the ones in D.C., we're probably just hearing about healthcare or Russia these days, and not much, not much else out of the hill. Well, I'm those dynamics curious. do drive the house, and so you have to uh, deal with them. So, to uh, uh, on energy and commerce, we deal with healthcare, believe it or not, uh, both general health and yeah. mental health, physical health and, and mental health, and uh, we also deal with the environment. Um, as a subset. I, actually, I'm the ranker on the Environment Subcommittee. So, uh, and as we meet, we have an Energy Subcommittee hearing uh, at this very moment where we have, um, as a presenter, Brad Jones from the New York State ISO. So ISOs and RTOs are going to be involved in uh, that discussion as to, uh, you know, what the uh, state of the art is, what the future holds, and uh, how do we perhaps foster a clean market energy market uh, within their grid alliances. So um, yeah, it's, uh, there's a plethora of issues and uh, somehow you know, the, the encouragement to get the healthcare thing done then I think creates an opening that allows for uh, you know, full-fledged discussion on some of these other issues that are extremely urgent. Yeah, so I, w I would like to dive into some of the things where you see the scope of opportunity might be to address energy issues sure. in the house. Before we do that, yeah. I would like to, to do the polling questions. So if we can get polling questions six up, uh, please, and get the audience to grab your, your clickers. This has gotta be a fun in. concept. Here so for... we'll, we'll see how this goes. Um, so polling question uh, number six here. Uh, we'd like to get your take on what should the federal government be prioritizing mm -hmm. And sorry, you only have these choices. I could have gone on with a longer list, but I had to pick six. We're going to go with these choices. Please go ahead and, and vote. And uh, when we get a good tally of votes, um, we'll go ahead and show the results. Uh, Congress will give you a chance to, to look at these and figure out how you want to react. You might predict what you expect to be the number one priority. Uh, while we're waiting for those results, or you can just... Well, wait. you know, I, I, if I predict, I'm probably going to sway people, and I, I just want to see this as um, uh, a straight, honest-to-goodness poll that's not pulling people in a certain direction. And then we'll talk about your results, but those are interesting choices, I will say that. Yeah, so I think we're getting close to 200. If folks could, uh, could go ahead and, and get their vote in, um, <coughs> and let's, let's go ahead and, and see the results. Oh, see the results, yep. We'll take a second here. Um, no, it's they're kind of long, so I know that you know. Who said a summit I isn't fun? Yeah. <laughs> I'll just wait till some of the questions come up. I've, I may have a plant or two in the audience too. We'll have to see how that <laughs> okay. how that goes. Um, so, so while we're waiting for the results, I think sure. people are, have have got their votes in, and we'll see the results pop up here in a minute. Um, w w where do you think that action will first will first come? on an energy topic well, in the House. We've had hearings, on, as I indicated today, we're having our subcommittee hearing on, on the grid system. So we've had um, digit, digitization hearings, we've had um, upscaling our, our, our investments in, uh, in the grid, we've had infrastructure issues yeah. brought up in a broader context, a lot of focus on roads and bridges, but I said, you know, we need to have an all of the above strategy for infrastructure that must include grid modernization, grid upgrades, grid investment. If we're going to be real about hooking into the system uh, as much as we can, the full capacity of our renewables, uh, there are many systems that 
designed for a monopoly setting, we're serving a region and now we're wheeling electrons from region to region, if not state to state, obviously, and certainly country to country. Uh, living in a border state in New York, yep. upstate New York, yep. as my district is, uh, where my district is located, um, we have discussions about importing Canadian power. Yep. So country to country. So the wheeling of electrons over this system which many suggested decades ago was antiquated, needs the attention, I think, of policymakers and certainly uh, requires budget investment. Uh, and so I'm hoping that, you know, there seems to be an across the board approval to infrastructure, yep. you know, so that the executive branch, the president, and the legislative branch uh, seem to be in similar thinking, perhaps not the same order of solution, okay. but at least the acknowledgement that roads and bridges need to be an investment and then hopefully pull us along to include grid in that discussion yeah. with other items like drinking water and, right. and broadband uh, that rail, I think would be important. Air, the rail, you got it. But if we could do a major package on infrastructure, I think there's bipartisan, bicameral agreements that can be struck. And I would hope that that would be the next focus as we get through the healthcare debate uh, or debacle, as yeah. ever we want to describe it. Um, but uh, a threatening outcome or a threatening discussion for many. Uh, I hear it all the time in my district. But then let's move on to some of these things that will drive the economy and build uh, the best response for energy. Right. Well, uh, I, I want to go a little more into the infrastructure question and grid modernization before we get to the next poll question, but you, you have a sense of where we're going. That's a sneak preview for you all uh, on the next poll question. But, but digging a little deeper on the infrastructure uh, question, so there are a lot of priorities you list, a lot of things that could be included. And we've seen that you know the big bill has had a hard time on the health care side. Um, besides the, the fact that infrastructure is going to benefit from more bipartisanship and um, more... Uh, you know, both the Senate and the House seem to have an interest in that priority. Are there other things? Is there a sense that maybe the big bill is the way to do it? Or are there little smaller well, bills that can get through and that can have a more likelihood to succeed because they're, they're smaller? Lids, lids I would pieces? hope it's the big bill. Okay. Um, I think that, you know, we've been languishing for a long time without a sound energy bill. The last year's outcome was very weak and, and disappointing. We actually had a grid piece in one of the original drafts, and then that was dropped. And we do the low-hanging fruit, the easy thing to accomplish. We did come to agreement on state energy office fundings. Yeah. We uh, have had uh, good acknowledgement of the importance of weatherization programs. But yeah. you know, some of those are the simpler things, and it, right. we need the boldness in an yeah. energy package. And I would hope that uh, the grid discussion would be there, especially in this era where you now have microgrids and you have you know uh, distributed energy right. opportunities and energy efficiency concepts that are all building into the equation and then you know working through on storage because the linchpin to developing the strength of our renewables is uh, is the uh, the battery yeah. development so um, the research that's required here and then the policy that will put together the investments and perhaps utilizing our grid situation uh, uh, in a way the, the New York State ISO is looking at a, the potential they're doing a study on a carbon uh, pricing carbon right. Uh, right. in, in the, uh, the grid operation. You know, we've got to move to those realms. Yeah. Uh, and it's tough, you know. We people said, well, the healthcare thing, you know, it's, you got so many players, and there's so many dis different approaches. Well, the same is true in energy. So yep. while we may all say we want to go forward with infrastructure, it's gone from straightforward, you know, paying out of the general fund to uh, tax incentives to contractors to build what you want, where you want, whenever you want to now perhaps regulatory relief that amasses to a trillion. So the same could happen. You know, as, as has happened in the healthcare arena, people have this intention to have access, affordability, and quality to be the driving forces. You can agree on that, and then the devil's in the detail. The same could happen here with the, uh, the grid issue or a large scale yeah. energy bill. Yeah. So it's interesting, you, you mentioned storage uh, as, a, as a key highlight. Our previous panel, uh, when the polling question came up, storage was by and far the technology that this audience at least believes will be most impactful. I think 40% of the res uh, respondents said storage for sure is going to be the most impactful. Well, impactful sure, you element. provide predictability. You, there's, a, you know, there's a, uh, 
a, a growth in the capacity opportunity. And uh, you know, for those who are managing the system, that's the way we provide for the resilience uh, that we need. So, and there's, with a great number of the general public that I serve, there's this growing acceptance, awareness, and uh, support uh, beyond acceptance of uh, climate change and, yep. and having to address carbon pollution. And uh, I think that's only going to grow with the next generation. I see the millennials talking about this all the time. Yep. You know, uh, how are we going to clean the air that we breathe? You know, how are we going to make safe the water we drink? So there is a, a huge impact coming. We ought to be ahead of the curve. Yep. And we ought to make certain that uh, we're finding out how we can best utilize all of these innovative concepts and the growth of green energy into the grid system. There was a, uh, a sparkle of hope uh, from a climate perspective out of the House. Uh, I don't know how much of it was just the press grabbing onto something or if there was some real substance there. But recently, there was an amendment that was introduced and then defeated for the, that would prevent for the, the defense, Department of Defense. That's the defense right. bill. And that right. was all about, about climate risk. Should we read a lot into that? Or, or what well, should we I, take away from I that? I think book? what it tells us, you know, people, it was, uh, you know, speak your truth here. And, um, you know, it put you know, called us to task on the issue. And the amendment was speaking to pretty much boiled down to whether you supported or agreed with the concept of carbon pollution, uh, climate change. And it passed overwhelmingly in the House, which told me there are many silent types yeah. that yeah. either believe in, in having to address carbon pollution or that their district is there. Well, if your district is there, we need to push. We need to have that pressure. So I would suggest to people who believe in efforts, policy efforts for carbon pollution reduction, carbon pricing, to really utilize that statement made in a way that now puts pressure on all of us that were in that yes column and, uh, and convert those in the no column. But the majority in the House said yes to, uh, uh, to that uh, amendment. And I think that's a very telling statement. And the silence at times is deafening. Yeah. So, so let's ask uh, another polling question. We'll try it again. We'll see if we can uh, get this question up. Um, so this is tied up into this, what we were just talking about with, with climate. And curious to see, uh, folks, you know, where are we feeling right now in this room about the politicization, politicization of some of these issues? Um, we might be able to guess what we, we think the answer is. but. Uh, I'd be curious to, to get the, the response from uh, folks here, and then maybe you can share your perspective about what folks here can, should be doing uh, to, to make sure that it's either depoliticized or you know, that there's a more constructive conversation that's, that's occurring. Right. Well, I think basically that uh, you know, the, the establishment of policy is there to speak to the greater needs of uh, the general public. And, you know, oftentimes you'll hear, well, let market forces rule. And, and well, that's okay. But at the same time, uh, market forces aren't necessarily going to reach everybody. Okay. And so I think the opportunity, the right to breathe clean air is something captured in the policy. So policy into the development of the energy route that we choose is something very critical. And uh, I think that we need to be part of that effort to uh, reduce carbon emission, greenhouse gas emissions, and make certain that uh, we do it in a way that is, uh, um, again, socially and economically acceptable, where um, we're providing for a universal outcome that is good for everyone, and then the secret is how to just pay for it in a fair context. Right. Well, let's see the poll results. If we can pull those up. All right. Well, most folks it's, say it's bad, uh, but there's a, a sizable group of folks that say it, it doesn't matter. So it's not overwhelming that politicization of clean energy has been, has been an issue. Um, thinking about... Well, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that um, I've introduced a bill that we've labeled um, <laughs> because of so, uh, the Scientific Integrity Act. Okay. And because there's so much denial of science in the two committees that I serve on, which are probably the two wonkiest committees in the House, okay. Energy and Commerce and Science, Space and Technology. Yeah. And to sit there and hear science denial 
drove me to the point of like, look, respond, don't just mumble, respond. So we created, we authored the Scientific Integrity Act, which would create watchdogs at all, watchdog panels at each of the federal agencies that utilize hard-earned federal tax dollars that are invested in research to be uh, followed through and monitored. And I think that, you know, when 97% of the science community, scientist community, says that we have what is a human-inspired um, outcome with carbon pollution, I think we need to do something about it. And uh, I think the world is there. The corporate field is getting there. There are those in corporate uh, leadership who are greening up. And I think government should be ahead of that curve. Yeah. And I mean, so if we're going to politicize clean energy, uh, it's not helping. We should just yeah. accept science and uh, truth and facts and data and move forward. Right. Well, only 10% think it's... Uh, <laughs> only 10% thought it was at all a good thing. So uh, it'd be interesting to see maybe during the networking break we can, we can find those people out and see uh, that <laughs> counter perspective. Contrarians are, are always interesting. If folks do have questions, we will have time for a, a few questions at the end. So come up to the mics and I will... I will um, break uh, the conversation for a question. So please come up if you, if you do have a specific question. Um, but, but as we're, we're getting back there, um, one of the other interesting bills that you co-sponsored uh, that's currently, I guess, somewhere in the process is this uh, effort to put $50 billion in potential funding for a green bank that would not necessarily directly loan but would enable state-level right. action. And so that's an interesting, both philosophically, you're saying, hey, if the Fed's aren't necessarily going to be the avenue, but the feds can enable state action. That's, that's interesting. And then it's also interesting to, to, to see that that particular issue of access to capital is one that you thought was a priority. Can you talk a little bit Absolutely. more about why you got behind that bill? Yeah, what, the, what, you know, what, with so many of these things, the outcomes are savings that are earned from the investments that are landed. Uh, and to be that upfront channel as a, as a government to enable us to incorporate our greening up um, policies uh, you want to be there to assist, to shave some of the risk, to make the uh, fun financing possible. And so I think what you have is the opportunity in a green bank that has worked very well in, um, in certain areas. Uh, and um, Connecticut has set an example. Uh, New York is uh, moving into a green bank concept. So I'm thinking if we have federal policy that will enable us to put this uh, into a much more aggressive mode, um, it would be very helpful to um, have us take the intellectual capacity of our nation that's developing the innovative concepts that enable us to go towards these, uh, um, these given designs that will enable us to incorporate the, the cleanup that we want to do. And so I think a green bank will be uh, super. We've been working with um, a new senator, Chris Van Hollen, okay. with yeah. whom I partnered with many times over in, uh, on bills in the House as uh, a rep from, uh, uh, from Maryland. And uh, Chris is very serious about the issue, as are some other senators and members in the House. And hopefully we'll uh, move this along. Uh, you know, I think what's so um, lost at times is the amount of jobs that are associated with the green economy, sure. the clean energy economy, the climate economy. Um, right now, wind technicians are one of the hot, that, that occupation, that job uh, uh, assignment is the fastest growing in our country. And we've seen tremendous growth in the solar arena um, with jobs. Um, yep. some, something in the neighborhood of 25 to 30% growth in jobs just in the last couple of years on an annual basis when the overall job growth was around 1.5%. So um, far ahead of the curve. And it's showing you that these are jobs that won't be offshore. Yeah. So uh, it's a soundness yeah. of investment. And there's a broader opportunity set when you talk about efficiency and demand response and grid modernization more broadly we can potentially. Uh, absolutely. And it's why I think the cuts proposed by the president in his presentation of a budget to Congress were so off mark. Uh, actually, I'd label them foolish because they're just not in context with where we're going as a nation yeah. and how competitive we have to be in the world economy. And dumbing down research zeroing it out, taking ARPA-E from the Department of Energy and, and just wiping it out, reducing the EERE, the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy wing yeah. of DOE, uh, cutting that by a billion dollars. These are foolish moves. 
These are not in context with a modern day grid system. And as states are developing in a progressive fashion, all of this work, they need assistance. They need a partnership that is true, that's valuable coming from the federal end. You know, it's almost like now we're relying on the states to carry forth with the Paris Agreement mm -hmm. yeah. as we pull us out. Well, governors and mayors in some communities, in some states where governors aren't doing their thing, mayors are stepping up to the plate. I believe it's Fort Worth and Dallas are stepping up to the plate, and the governor of Texas is not. In my home state, Governor Cuomo is stepping up to the plate. Other governors are doing that. We should have a national agenda that speaks to our commitment to the Paris Accord, especially because we are part of the inspiration of that global discussion at that table in Paris. Yeah. Well, let's let's go to a couple of questions. I'm not sure if they're exactly on that theme, but Karen, we'll let uh, you can go first, and then Steve, we'll we'll grab you right after. Thanks. You're welcome, Karen. You're on now, I think. Thank you. No? You're not. This, one, this one's on. Well, Karen, uh, Steve, why don't you go ahead and go first, and then we'll, we'll come back to Karen. Sorry about that. Hello, Steve. Congressman, I will follow up on what you said. Um, as you know, I testified to Congress, called to testify to Congress on the President's budget, and respectfully disagreed with the, many of the things you mentioned. Interestingly, I got quietly some positive feedback from Republicans, you know, sort of on the side. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. So my question is, when will Republicans in Congress, the good ones and a lot of good ones, actually become more vocal in saying to the president, no, as opposed to just hiding? Yeah. <laughs> is that going to happen? Well, when? I would hope that we'll get through that um, pattern with the health care debate. Um, many people have stayed silent. In my home state, the Medicaid devastation, the Medicaid cuts create devastation in the state of New York. People need to step up to the plate and speak out forcefully. Hopefully that will develop the boldness, that will develop the, uh, the style that Congress needs to have right now. These are devastating cuts. Th these are historically large cuts in many ways. And uh, people are in private conversation saying, this will set us back. As I said earlier, standing, standing still in this given moment of time is dangerous enough. You know, I, I met with some Chinese entrepreneurs who are developing, developing hydrogen stations, uh, fueling stations in China. And through an interpreter, I had asked like how much they're putting in their budget for marketing. And as the translator is sharing the question with the, uh, the Chinese uh, entrepreneur, He's chuckling, and I'm thinking, oh, wow, this is going to be a no-brainer answer. <laughs> and he said that people are begging for these. Their eyes burn. Their health is being deteriorated. And so they're going aggressively, investing a million dollars per station uh, in, in, in the, the Chinese uh, the cult, in, in, in the Chinese situation. And I'm thinking, there they are, aggressively investing in alternative uh, fuels, and we're here arguing about the concept of carbon pollution, climate change, global warming. We don't need that kind of setback in this given budget cycle. We need to be aggressive and forward and speaking out. So hopefully the healthcare thing will be a learning curve for us that will then give us that reassurance that we keep up the, uh, the lifting of the voices. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Karen. Uh, Congressman, I'm Karen Butterfield with STEM, uh, an energy storage startup company in California, and I'll be heading right back to the bubble as soon as that conference is over. <laughs> uh, but my question for you is what kind of advice would you give me and the crowd here if we don't live in a blue state or in a state where our senators and Congress people are you know, thoughtful and progressive and admitting uh, that we have climate change, what, what could we do? You know, I, I co-chair SEEK, the Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition in the House. There are about 60 members who are very green in their thinking and uh, help push that agenda in the, uh, in the greater population of the House. When we've had different guests in, and one stands to mind in particular, is a uh, a minister who took time off, a fundamentalist type, who took time off because he so believes 
uh, in the agenda of climate change and carbon pollution reduction. So I was somewhat atypical, but he had great advice. And a number of others have repeated that device in separate discussions. Have it seen through the eyes of our children. Develop a message with my counterparts um, that speaks to a better tomorrow for our children. And equate it to a, you know, a very good visual. Like, do we not want our children to be able to drink water that's safe out of the cups that, you know, that, we, that they're drinking from? Do we not want them to breathe clean air so that their lungs are healthier? And you just humanize it as much as possible through the context of children. The other is the moral compass, the stewardship that we should believe is assigned to us to hand over an environment that's borrowed uh, and sent on to the next generations, generations unborn, in a much better state. I think that's how we're going to win it. If we get into the nuts and bolts, into the minutia, into the weeds on this one, and talk about where science is and what the facts are, it just causes resistance. Um, and so I think we need to build the human dynamics and the moral compass discussion, which I think will be the most effective way to uh, message on this issue and bring people over. And I also will talk to people about, look, if you don't believe in these concept, concepts, um, is it so bad to have safer water to drink? Is it so bad to have cleaner air to breathe? It's not a negative, it's a positive. And guess what, to do that, we need to create a lot of sound paying jobs, uh, including jobs in research, which are extremely valuable. So, you know, turn it into that economic discussion too. Great. Well, thanks. I know you've got to get back to your hearing. Yeah. I'd like you to leave us with, you know, uh, a lot of the vibe out of, out of DC is, is kind of negative. Uh, is, there, is there something optimistic you could leave us with as far as what the federal government uh, can do going forward? Maybe well, that's a stumper question, it, sorry, but uh, looking for a little ray of hope, a little sunshine. You know, I, I recently got, had a great discussion with my Republican counterparts in the House and some Democrats in a small, networking on uh, clean drinking water infrastructure. And I think we're making progress. Okay. And if there's anything that one of the, uh, from some negatives, positives might flow. I think that there's a lot of um, uh, anger being exchanged with us when we go home. For me, it's every weekend. And now we're going to have this August recess, work recess, where we work in the district for the next five to six weeks or at least I will be, um, that anger is, I think, telling some of all of us that we got to show progress here on something. And so some of these issues that perhaps might not have been addressed may come to a, an agreed upon solution simply because healthcare just seems to be a tough one to close. And uh, that may be beneficial, and we should take that and work it to the max. So it's a good way to, I think, begin to talk about yeah, grid up, up, uh, updates and modernization. And if we have that down to a science and to an agreement, hopefully we can fold that into a bigger bill on infrastructure. If not, let it stand on its own. Drinking water should be folded into the larger in infrastructure bill, but we're pushing this so that perhaps it might go in its own um, modest version. Great. Well, please join me in, in thanking the congressman for joining us. Thank you, Tanesh. Thank, Thank you, you so much. It's great. Thank you. you. And we'll be moving right into our next panel. Uh, we've got uh, Julia's going to tee yep, that up for yep. us. Yep. If we can, we're going to get some chairs reset Thank on the Tanesh. stage, and if we can get our next panel to make your way on up here, that would be great. I'll try to fill some air while that happens. Uh, I hope everybody is feeling inspired after that. I know I am. Uh, just a couple of, of facts uh, for your reference. I actually met the congressman for the first time. Just to give you a sense, I think you already can tell what a great guy he is, but he does these things called Talks with Tonko. I can't remember how frequently. It's like one Friday a month or something like that, where he just invites, he picks a topic that he's interested, and he invites in stakeholders to come talk to him about it. So I did one of the, went and joined one of those talks a couple of years ago like on some energy topic, um, and it was really great just to have that very informal conversation, which is just so rare to see that type of invitation come from the Hill. So it's great. Uh, and then the other thing was, 
You know, I wish we had the foresight to ask him to come speak here. He actually called us and said, hey, I see you guys are having this, this Grid Evolution Summit. Can I come talk? Um, so just again, just to see his leadership up, up on the hill, but the fact that he wants to come here and talk about these issues with the industry, I think is, is just really inspiring.